Bigger than ever, it's the unofficial 40 from Soonerscoop.com. Presented by the Choctaw Casino and Resort in Durant. Now, here's the entire Soonerscoop crew. Carrie, Josh, Eddie, and Bob. All right, we are back. It is the post-Heisman edition of the Choctaw Casino and Resort. In Durant, unofficial 40 podcast with the whole crew back once again. We just talked to Lincoln Riley and Kyler Murray yesterday, so we'll we'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, Lots of recruiting going on as Lincoln Riley just got back in town yesterday for the Sooners' first practice of the spring. Uh, He talked about injury news a little bit. We've got that to go over. Uh, And obviously, what he was doing out on the road was recruiting. Uh, a lot of social media floating around out there about where he's been. Uh, coaches all over the place. Uh, Spencer Rattler has been visited. Lincoln was out in California. We talked to him at the press conference about defensive recruiting, and he got asked about coordinators and all that stuff. Uh, so plenty to get to. But first, I want to remind you guys, uh, this is the Choctaw Casino and Resort uh, in Durant Unofficial 40 podcast. And uh, I want to remind you guys to check them out, ChoctawCasinos.com. Uh, it is, it's really close by. If, especially if you live in the Dallas area. I know we have probably more Dallas listeners than anywhere else in the country. Uh, but uh, Oklahoma City, Tulsa, uh, it's not far away. Uh, you don't have to settle for the usual night out. You can go find yourself uh, amongst the slot machines, the table games, the poker room. Uh, you can indulge in delicious dining. They've got top entertainment acts coming out there. Chris Stapleton's going to be out there. Uh, you get tickets through SeatGeek on that, by the way. Uh, and a uh, relaxing new spa uh, so, look, I've been out there, stayed for the weekend. The restaurants are fantastic. The steakhouse, uh, Gillies, the sports bar, the bowling alley, uh, the, the theater. Uh, it is a fantastic place. So, ChoctawCasinos.com, go check them out. All right, we're going to welcome in uh, Josh McQuistion to the program first. And I'm going to admit something. This is the second time we've started the podcast because I'm using new equipment today, and I aired. I screwed up the podcast. So, Josh, welcome again. Well, and I'm thank everyone you behind again. The yeah, I'm here. And, you know, like I said the first time, I never know what to say on the intros. I'm always lost here. And hopefully Bob does not repeatedly dive in and, you know, crash this thing. He tried to do that before. Eddie Radosevich is sitting right across from me. Hello. He's wearing his Old Row Outdoors hat. Is, in a, is that a marijuana leaf on there? No. It looks like, a, from afar, it looks like a marijuana. It's a duck. It's a duck? Okay. Let me... It'd be pretty cool if it was a marijuana leaf, though. It's a duck. I think people would mistake it for a marijuana leaf, though. Really? Has From somebody said anything? If they're old and blind like me. I think they carry glasses. I think, it's, dark. I think it's a little darker in here. Yeah, my lights are... I'm so bad about replacing lights. Hey. Bob, you sit next to him in the press box. Does he have binoculars? Yes, he does. Uses okay. them, too. I have very large binoculars. I pretty much watch the entire game through binoculars. I, what I do, this is what I don't, I don't. This is such a stupid thing that I'm talking about this, but what I do is, is when the ball is snapped, if it's a run play, I stay with the binoculars. If it's a pass play, I immediately put down the binoculars and see what happens. So all this RPO shit's pissing you off. Right? I cannot. No, I, I can figure it out. I mean, okay, okay. I don't think I'd be able to watch a game through the binoculars like that. I it's the only like, way I can do tough. it. Like it's it's the only way I'm comfortable watching a football game. Like, and I say that, and I watch the game through a, a lens. Yeah. So I I don't know. Maybe I'm. I'm telling you, like like you know, we talk about this all the time. I found this out at OU Texas this year because uh, my best friends, mom and dad, both passed away. I was gonna go sit with them. Bob knew I was just. He probably thought, man, this guy's insane. So I told him I would come and sit with him during the game. And as the game got closer and I went up and I was doing the pregame thread and, uh, you know, like Justin Broyles was fighting people down there and it was just a, it was chaotic. And the game kicked in there and the national anthem, I was like, I can't do this. I can't do this. Like, this is OU Texas. I gotta like, stay home. I have to be, yeah, I, I, it was like, you know, hot water burn baby. I mean, it was, I was literally Rain Man up there. I couldn't do, I, if I didn't, be, if I wasn't able to stay up there and be on my laptop and do instant analysis and look through my binoculars and get the stats. Like, 
I was going to freak out. Now, I do bug carry to look at them when there's an injury because I don't bring any binoculars. I'm just using my eyes. But when there's an injury, I'm like, yo, yo, who's that? What's going on? Well, to me, that's the, I mean, and when OU, I don't know that they have enough room on the sidelines to have a tent. I hope that's the case. If they ever get a tent, it's going to ruin me. Like, that's my favorite thing is because, like, on instant analysis or on Twitter, that's the one thing I can do that TV can't do. Like, they go to commercial when there's injuries. So I can tell you they're looking at their right leg or their, you know, knee or uh, it looks like they're looking at his head or whatever. I mean, I, that's the one time I kind of get to report. It's cool to me. I like it. I think that is probably the reason why they don't have one is because of the... It's a really tight sideline. I mean, it's it not like a, OSU tight. No, but, but it is small. I mean, you get a lot of people down there. There already are because you have people. to like you have to like squeeze your way behind the bench when you change fields. Yeah, change end zones or whatever. Yeah, yeah, in between quarters, it it's a they they have way too many people down there already. So it's uh, I don't know. You get used to it though. So anyway, that was a really weird tangent to start the show off with. We have so many other things to talk about, but yeah, Kyler won a Heisman. Kyler won the Heisman Trophy, the seventh Heisman Trophy winner. And I think I did this with Baker last year, but like I don't think he realized when he was up there, like, oh, I'm gonna have a life size statue on the campus of me now for the rest of my life. Like I played here for a year, and then when I'm dead and gone, there's gonna be a statue of me. Like, is it bad when Bob got his statue? I thought like that's gonna be here after Bob dies because he's closer to death than Kyler Murray is. It depends. I mean, if it's natural, he's closer. But age. but like that's kind of that moment when a when a player's like shit I really did do something here like they're gonna build a statue of me yeah and and he played for one year I know it's unbelievable it has been I mean I I would say the only thing comparable Josh is probably Josh Heupel's two years at OU as far as out of nowhere yeah just what he did for a program in Cam a short Newton? period of time no, I mean at OU oh okay God, f- him. Cam? Mark. I got a mark on this machine. He, uh, he built a church. <laughs> no. A church of Bagman. Someone built the church for him. <laughs> it, I would like to go back and listen to the podcast that we did at the beginning of the season. And even, like, I remember that I've gotten a bunch of shit from some of my buddies. Uh, they have a big, long text group that we have. And uh, even, like, going back into, like, 2014 before Marie even uh, a lot of going back. transferred. There's like I have this tw- this uh, text that's like, you know, talk about when are we going to get Murray updates or whatever. So you haven't urban it, mired your phone. I I basically put never again or it never will happen like yeah. twenty times, <laughs> and uh, they gave me a bunch of shit. Your hot on Saturday, yeah, on Saturday night about that. He's like, well, you got freezing cold take did. on your own text group. Yeah, exactly. Uh, but it, I mean, it's insane. He's been he's he's been so good that. Even the Heisman voters, like it was, I thought it was going to be closer than that. I, I did too. Same. And the fact that the South was what it was, I mean, like Alabama fans, you can be pissed off all you want. Oh, we're going to kick your ass because of this. You almost, Tua almost lost in the South. I mean, that's not almost, but I mean, he was not a convincing winner in the South. And I don't think it had anything to do with backlash against Tua or anything. It was just, I, there's nothing that he really did that resonated, and Kyler had all those special moments down the stretch, including playing your biggest two games as your final two games and coming up huge in both of them. Well, the, the funny part to me, the whole argument kept being, well, Kyler's played so many more snaps and all these sort of things, and his efficiency numbers were as good or better than than Tua's. Like. You don't understand you do that more, that means yeah. he's being more efficient when over you, more plays. When you do twice the work and still do it at a high level, that should be rewarded. Like, I, yep. I never understood that argument. Well, Tua never had to play in the fourth quarter. Okay. <laughs> like, <laughs> Neither I, would that, Kyler if he had that defense. Yeah. It doesn't make sense. Yeah, I, I think that, I mean, obviously, I'm going to say this, but I, I think they got it right. They did. I definitely think they got it right. He he was the best player this year, and I or the most outstanding player, however they – the bullshit that the Heisman Trust puts out there for the uh, rules and regulations Most on who to vote for. Most outstanding player, yeah. It's all stupid. So, I mean, but yeah, for one year to have a, a legacy for a life for forever, not even a lifetime, forever. I mean, that only six other people have done. I mean, you think about all the years that people have worshipped Billy Vessels and Billy Sims, Steve Owens. 
Well, that's the next conversation that you have to have. I mean, if, if they the were to win the seven, well, if I think either that or if they were to win two games over the, their next two games and win a national title, he Kyler Murray would have far and away the best resume of any OU player to ever play one year in greatest in one year career, the greatest ever. one year ever. There wouldn't but be. But how a does debate. that translate to is he the best player to ever play at OU? Because I think you could make that argument. Couldn't you? If he had the best, if they one, win the next two year, games, hell yes, he's the best player to ever play at Oklahoma. Yes, I they think so too. Beat and Bama I, and Clemson. I, I caught a bunch of shit for that. Like I, I think that you know, obviously, there's a lot of people that would say Baker because of what he did for three years, consistently for three years. But who's to say that Murray wouldn't get better than what he is now? You know, I, I yeah. it just it it's insane to me to think that he sat out, got kind of f-ed over by the NCAA. But it benefited Baker Mayfield in 2017, and then he yeah. stays around one more year, and this is what they have. And, I mean, he's done it with – well, I, I, I guess it has helped. He's had one of the best offensive lines in the country. Um, but he Do doesn't necessarily – I mean, yeah. yeah I mean, but, Baker, but, but Baker, Baker doesn't championship happen. championship game, Miles Teese and Nick Basquain yeah. were their sure. bread bankers. I like that, oh, I, I I like that you, you butchered Basquine. What did I say? Basquine? I was thinking of uh, some kind of French name. Well, actually, I was first thinking, Bobine? is it really Nick? And then uh, I got caught up. So That's oh, well. gold. I love it. I uh, snorted some Adderall with uh, Donald Trump this morning. Did you? Yeah. Good to know. Good to admit. It's finals week. Felony. Uh, it's you you don't have any finals. <laughs> Do you see that out there? What? Yes. Oh, the Alabama, the Arkansas no, guy. No, that. No. Uh, oh, he's he's screwed well, yeah. too. He let down a lot of classmates getting arrested with ninety eight and a half pound, uh, grams of weed. Yeah. Forty Xanax and an AK. Yeah, you always that that sent it over the top a little bit. I don't know if you needed that. <laughs> he's like trying to. He. I mean, when you have an AK, you're trying to gain territory. Like you're all of a sudden. What do they call that? Uh, colonialism. Is that? Like when you try and take over other nations. Oh, like, yeah. He's trying to take over the Arkansas ca- drug trade. I would imagine that's a pretty steady business. For weed, yeah. In Fayetteville. Well, any college town. But well, that guy probably secretly sure. lobbied to uh, get marijuana voted down in Arkansas. Probably. Although, if you got an AK, I don't know if you're, if you're lobbying. You probably don't have a voter identification card if you have a... <laughs> <laughs> There'd be a lot of gun people that'll take offense to that, but whatever. Uh, so but yeah, you have to be a great to be the best. So I mean, hell, I mean, I think I'm I'm of that opinion that the Selmans need to have. St- I mean, they need to have a defensive, especially in the this day and age, they need to have a defensive square or something. Because those guys never win the Heisman. They're never going to win. The, I mean, Charles Shit, Woodson. And, who's going to make it from this group? Well. Nobody. You'd have to start going. That's back what I'm a saying. Years. You need to have something for people to aspire to maybe, on the defensive well, side of the if, ball. If they start playing better defensively, you can start pushing that to get something built to further along the new like class. Gerald McCoy, uh, Leroy, Teddy'd probably be in there. Bosworth. You did have to put Teddy in there, didn't you? He's he's would consensus. He? Uh, but two time Butkus. Yeah, I think he would. I think he'd make it in the make the cut. Does Roy Williams make the yes. cut? Yes. Yes. Yeah. And then we have to have 5,000 Twitter polls about, you better do the Superman pose. What I what would you guys say the baseline is? Like coach. two national awards? Like you had to win an Outland and a Gursky or something like that? Well, like, I mean, uh, Derek Strait won the, the Thorpe and the Nagurski. So, yeah, I mean, I'd have no problem with him being there. Uh, he's a great player. And they're running out of campus space. They're going to have to call out <laughs> Boone Pickens before he dies to, to figure out how to... What was the what was the term that they did with all those houses up there? They oh they didn't uh, acquire them, but it was like it's a, a um, university. Um, God damn it! I don't even know what it's called. It's been a while since they've done. I'm that. not rich enough or smart enough to know what it's called. We're gonna everybody's gonna be yelling at us, listening back to the podcast. Sorry, land people. Sorry, real estate real moguls. Estate, yeah, it'll come to me. Um, but yeah, that that that's a. I don't know. If you made a defensive legends park, I mean, Switzer had so many. Because, I mean, you got to think about, like, Ricky Dixon. I mean, there's so many people that you don't think about that were consensus All-Americans. Yeah. There were. Well, was Dusty would, ever consensus? 
I don't know if he was consensus. I don't. I I would doubt it because of what happened to him late in his career. Maybe he didn't oh, get yeah. all those votes that yeah. you would normally get. Well, consensus. The consensus All American status kind of took a hit this week with Kyler Murray not being <laughs> named one. And I. I mean, it really doesn't matter. I'm sure he'd rather take the Heisman anyways. But uh, it is kind of funny that the last time it happened was 2000 when uh, Chris Winking won the Heisman, but wasn't the consensus All American. Kyler was the AP Player of the Year, right? AP Player of the Year, and uh, what was the other one? Uh, he had two of the five. Well, he was uh, he won the Davy O'Brien. That's right. And then the Walter Camp went to Tua. Tua. And then the Maxwell went to Tua. Yeah. Yes. Uh, so anyway, but, uh, you know, I think what we were initially talking about was Kyler and moving forward and Baker and, you know, is it the best ever? Here's what I think is probably, and I asked him about this yesterday, and he he, he kind of, I think him watching Baker do what he's done this year makes him, you know, say, if he's doing it, I can do it. Like, you, that's got to run through your mind. Like, what am I leaving on the tape? Because if, if well, Baker can do it, I think I just played just like Baker did. I think I'm as good as him. I think the other funny part of this whole thing has been, like, you know, SI came out with something today, a story about how, Baker had sent his name in to get the draft uh, Kyler. draft or Kyler yeah had sent his name in to get the uh, draft grade why wouldn't he like I don't yeah. understand how that's such a big deal well and I, there was a time when I thought it might be a possibility he could come back to OU I think that that's not a possibility now. no I, right financially though if you if it came down to financials I think football's the way to go no 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 look at early look at, on Early. Like that first contract, obviously look you're going to look at gonna, Bryce Harper. No, what he's staring in the face. Obviously. Look at look at pool holes. Look at look yeah, at those Mike are, Trout. Those are thirteen time all stars, though. <laughs> but I'm saying he has Mike Trout abilities. No, whoa, so. whoa, whoa, whoa! Not power. Not even, not even but close. I'm talking about as a center fielder, as a he base has, stealer, as a hit. You know, just an overall average hitter. Mike Trout's dick could throw harder than <laughs> Kyler could from center field. I, I'm going to say like. He's a really Tim, good. Don't Tim, get me wrong. Tim Raine should be the aspiration. There you go. Skip Johnson's compared him to Andrew McCutcheon, and McCutcheon okay. just signed no, a really yeah. nice that's, contract. Yeah, he's that's got a good eight million, million for three years as an old backloaded man. with the Phillies, and I mean he's going to get. I, I forget how much it was, but I think it was over two hundred mil. But okay, Andrew McCutcheon just got fifty eight million. Aaron Rodgers. Aaron Rodgers signed a contract for a hundred million. He's the best. Okay, one that, of the top two quarterbacks in the league. I stated that wrong. I, I think that three the, years, fifty eight million. If he was, I believe. if he was like a middle or end of the first round draft pick, he's going to probably make what, like eight million in his signing bonus? Isn't it already graded out? Yes, in the NFL? it's already slotted. So you'd have to pay back the four point six, and then right. you'd get money on top of it. So I, I think in the short term, it would be in a like. I guess what I'm trying to say is, I think it would be easier to go play baseball than come back to football, right? So Aaron Rodgers signed a four year. One hundred million dollar guaranteed contract. It was over. It was actually one hundred thirty four million. So he's and you know how that works. You you basically make your guarantee in the NFL because the way things are going, they're going to draft another quarterback here in the next couple of years, and they're going to Lamar Jackson his ass. Yeah. Well, either way, he's going to be making a shit ton of money playing something professionally. By the way, it it was both cool and sad to see Joe Flacco. This week, after it was announced, he was the backup now. Because, like, an NFL quarterback, you're not taking one for the team. You're not the 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 stuff right. we have to deal with every day. Where, like, if a kid doesn't win the starting job, he has to come out and say, "Oh, I support my teammates. Yeah. I just want to be a good teammate, and uh, you know, I'm I'm, I'm going to keep competing every day for that." Joe Flacco basically comes out and he's like, "This sucks. <laughs> like, I got injured, and then they drafted this guy, and they retired him. Yeah, basically, basically, they're ending my career." Sucks. Life comes at you fast. <laughs> Joe don't, Flacco. I don't know how he can ever be like. Well, the Ravens did me oh, he wrong. Won the they lottery. gave him that he, fucking contract. He won the lottery. He had that one great postseason and had made an entire career off of it. Not that he's been like bad, but he's been nobody. Nobody special. The Ravens could have done what they've done with a lot of different quarterbacks. It'll be interesting. There's. I you know obviously there's going to probably be and probably not fair but there will be a lot of uh, stock put into what Kyler does over the next oh for sure you know two games as far yeah. as where he would go in the draft I you know I I don't think that there's any doubt that 
I mean, who would have who would have thought at this time last year that Baker was going to be the first first pick in the NFL if, draft? If he were to struggle against Bama, they're going to say, "See, again, Big Twelve defenses, he looks like a star. When he plays a real team, he needs to go to baseball. This yeah. isn't for him. You oh, know yeah. that's coming. Oh, I think OU eliminated that though last year when they you would you would think that they did, but but they got to do it again. You listen to national folks talk, and you know, obviously, I mean, even I saw. A, it was a dumb tweet today, but it was from like a cab driver in Vegas that said he was joking around. Said that uh, he had picked up an A scout, and the A scout said he wanted, uh, you know, Alabama. He did, he obviously didn't want Kyler to get hurt, but he wanted Alabama to show him what big foot, big boy football is all about, and you know, kind of show him a lesson or whatever. But it, I, I don't know. Oklahoma I, has made the Final Four three out of four years. I think they know what big boy football is. We know that. But I think nationally, there's a lot of people out there that, like, if OU doesn't get over the hump again, right. there's going to be a lot of sentiment that... They'll never the, be for. It'll be, it'll be bad for the Big 12. It'll be worse for OU as far as, I, I don't think under this format, the Big 12 won't get the benefit of the doubt anymore. I agree And I don't 100%. think they would have this year if it wasn't Oklahoma. It needs to be a competitive game. If it would have been, right. been TCU or Baylor or OSU even... They're not getting in ahead of Ohio State. The big, I mean, and I think that's why Bowlesby came out yesterday in the athletic and and said little that Bob, it's time. Little balls built, Bob. Uh, I little think balls built, he understands. Bob. And say that. Here's the problem, and I've said this before: the college football playoff committee. They're all about brand names. Absolutely, mm-hmm. they're all they about got what brand they wanted. Names. They got their blue bloods in there. So, and it's it's run by it's not just run by the Power Five conferences. It's run by the blue bloods. And, well, and that's why the the whole bullshit with uh, Nicole Auerbach, her article yesterday. Don't tell me they care about UCF. They care no. about the Big Ten. Yeah, the Big Ten's pissed off that they didn't get in for the second straight year. Right, guys, you look at it: Notre Dame, Oklahoma, and Alabama pretty much swap Ohio State for Clemson, and they've got exactly what they want. Absolutely, right. I mean, you're yeah. you're covering almost every major area of the country. And they and they would like it if Texas would replace Oklahoma. Sure. Oh, sure, sure, sure. You're right. You're right. But, so, but that's all. That's the only two they really want in that thing. No doubt. And you better go undefeated if you're going to make it in. If you're from the Big Twelve or even the Big Ten, and you're not Ohio State, Michigan, and you're not Oklahoma, Texas. Yeah, I, my OSU buddies say it all the time, and it's it's a fact. It's a blue blood sport. Like OSU has to go undefeated to get in. But guess what? I mean, Washington. They can get. So does Notre Dame, can, though. Oklahoma State. If you go undefeated, you can get in. I mean, th- it's not. It's not like it is for UCF. I think it's harder than ever to go undefeated, though, isn't it? Yeah, but it's tough. It's tough. But if you want to win a national championship and you're not a blue blood, that's what you have to do. Yeah. No, it, it, Unless you just have some unreal. People don't like to talk about three it. Three game fact. conference schedule, un- non conference schedule, and you run the table in those three. You yeah. have to run the yeah. table in those three. Or if you get if you lose by. Like Michigan, Notre Dame. If the other team goes undefeated, then that's your only loss. You lost by three. You got a pretty good chance. Yeah, well, it's, it's worked out really well for OU the last three years. But I'm saying that you're saying three that of the OU four. it works. That doesn't. That, oh yeah, that, that formula everybody doesn't else? work for anybody else but no. Texas in the Big Twelve. No, or anybody else in the Big Ten besides Ohio State or Michigan. No, it's, it's shitty, but that's the way that's the way it is. I mean, if, and really take take out USC same deal in the Pac-12 yeah probably yeah i mean you look at this year if west if west virginia would have been 11 and 1 would not have mattered they would have been 6 or 7 yeah yep no way they wouldn't have passed ohio state or georgia i bet i i i'd bet you money georgia would have jumped them in that scenario and let's face it too though i mean those people look at oklahoma ohio state uh alabama clemson uh, no, Notre Dame, not so much, but like Michigan. I mean, these are all teams that are in the top ten in recruiting every year. So, no matter what happens, they can say, "Well, these teams have better athletes than everybody, so they should be." Like, it's a self fulfilling thing. Like, you recruit well, even if you have a down year. People look at your your players and they say, "Well, those are the best players in the country." Even if Iowa State is a better team than you and plays defense better than you and doesn't have the recruits that you have in the committee's eyes, if everything's even. They're going with Oklahoma. No doubt about that. You know, but to be fair, wouldn't you? I, th- I, I'm just, I think it's, it's a bias. In no, I, I, I'm just saying, like, I think it's probably there for all of us, as much as we want to rail against it. If I like say it, like you're saying, everything's equal, and Iowa State and Oklahoma are coming down to it, or you know, or, uh, 
we'll, we'll make it more interesting. Like well, Northwestern. Yeah, let's say Northwestern had beat Ohio yeah. State. You know. Yeah. Like if it's coming down to that argument, I I would not lie that in my mind's eye, I'm going to say Oklahoma has better personnel. I feel like they've got a better chance to beat Alabama just because of the per, the people they recruit year in and year out. Look, Ohio whether, State. Ohio State had better personnel than Purdue across the board. Sure, sure. And Purdue proved that by going six and six or whatever they yeah. went. Yeah. yeah. I think that's the yeah. basis of the argument, though. That that is completely unfair to to judge it like that. But it's only human to do it like that. Well, because I mean, at some point you have to make a gut call. Like it has to be, you know. I prefer this team because whether like we under whether we feel that way or not. Ohio State and Oklahoma, that's a judgment call. It is. They're both conference champions. They both had one loss. Uh, the problem, you have, here's to, the, you have to rank it on your criteria. God. Jesus. Uh, that's a, this is a, what a damn Macintosh gets for you. Um, so, uh, so, uh, so, so here's the thing. The problem is, like Washington State this year, they, if they would have won that last game, it would have been like you haven't had enough instances where an Oklahoma State or a Washington State uh, or a TCU, you haven't had enough of those come up where everybody else in a Power Five conference gets pissed off about the system. Like it's just like, oh, okay, the Big 12's making it in. We're we're fine as a conference. You're not. You're and you're not fine as the Big Ten. They already know it. You're not fine as the Pac-12. The only the only one that's fine is the SEC, and they're probably the more they probably carry the, the loudest not voice fine. about being pissed off because Georgia didn't get in. Yeah, it's insane. Oh well, it works out for you a lot. I like it when somebody from work calls you to tell you something you already knew. Interrupts yeah. your podcast. Three assholes I work with do that a lot. <laughs> Well, you never answer the phone, so so true. We need to talk about this. Like, we need to podcast shame Josh. <laughs> it's an intervention. I thought right. about this the other day. Like, we need to start shaming each other more. Josh is like literally, and this is not. This is not a like. This is even before text, Josh. Like, Josh literally will not answer his phone. I don't like answering my phone. It's it's. I'm not even gonna try to refute it. It's all on it. Be a grown up. Like Bob, let's a, a let me ask you. Like, me. be a grown up and text me. Has that has that? And I'm not saying you guys. I mean, we we all communicate through our our group that we have various social groups. You have them, uh, so we have our our group of choice, and we all do our communications, our planning, everything through that. But like, literally, if there's something like, if you call Josh because you really need to talk to him, he's not answering. Like Guys, if, I can, if I call I, you to say our bank account is empty, Josh, I don't know what to do. You're not picking up the phone. But if you leave that message, you know I will call you back swiftly. <laughs> swiftly? Oh yeah. Oh, I checked the message. Like as soon as the hang up, I'm like, uh, oh, you yeah, bastard. Okay, I, I don't, I don't have to deal with that as quickly. Be a grown I, up and text I'm not me always screening. I really am not. Tiffany, Tiffany would. She listens to the pod now. She would love to dive in on this. She literally. She will call me when she gets off from work, and if I do not answer, then she'll text, and she just says hi. And then if she if she doesn't get me in a few minutes there, she just starts hitting me on Twitter with DMs because she knows my Twitter is up. Like, she knows that's happening. Eddie's so, head is literally buried in his phone 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and it has been ever lot. since I met him. Like, he's the first, he's the first, I'd say, kid at the time when we first started working together. When he was a kid, like, it was, then we'd always be traveling like it astounded me at how much he was his face was buried in his phone and now I'm just as bad I'm just trying to keep up trying to keep up with the and world. you do a great job of that the news you're always stop. And like we always appreciate like Eddie is kind of our on the beat guy like you wonder like what does Eddie do besides shoot video like Eddie basically tells us everything that's going on in the world and sometimes like I will see something and I'll start to send the message and Eddie pops up before I can even do anything. That happens a lot as far as uh, somebody will send me something. I'm like, yeah, I saw that a couple hours ago. <laughs> <laughs> Just really I condescending. Hate, I, well, and I hate <laughs> saying that, but it's like it, it like, does aggra late, it aggravates me, too. Yeah. It's like I, that happened. Like somebody will send something that, uh, you know, happened, you know, like a week ago. Uh -huh. It's like, 
Jesus it's like yes, like your Where mother. Have you been? Yeah. Like your, like your well, mom always. And then I'm like, oh yeah, nobody else is just plugged in all day on their phone. It's kind of pathetic. And that's the call though. What's the proper protocol on that? Because I'll get stuff from my buddies, and I'm like, you know, they're like they'll it'll be in my group text, and they're like. Just you hear about this? I'm like, literally, you're linking something from our site. Like, yeah, I heard about <laughs> yeah. it. Like, I got my it. name is on the byline on that thing yeah, you just sent yeah. me. Josh, did you hear violence. they got this recruit? Yeah, I really don't. yeah, I did the interview. Uh huh. <laughs> yeah, that's kind of like somebody saying, "Did you hear what Ben Powers said about crushing kids' teeth in on the fourth? Yes, I asked <laughs> yes. the question. <laughs> I and I, I was also in Arlington when he said it the first time around. Yeah, the crush people's dreams. Yeah, crushing people's dreams. That one's better. I like that one better. Oh, it's way oh, better. Yeah. Yeah. He, yeah. And it was unexpected. Like, like, we didn't know he was so insane. The powers point. are a goddamn gift to Earth is what they are. Are I they mean, not the greatest? They are. Like, I was, I kind of, I think I made Gabe Eichard mad because I said Ben Powers is the best offensive line interview in the history of OU football. And, uh, of course, I did it kind of take a dig at him because Gabe was very personable and, you know, he... Even when he was playing, he was a great interview because he, he gave you right. whatever you wanted and more. But Ben Powers, I you know what I love most about Ben is he has replaced Bob Stoops as the guy that makes you work to get a quote. Lincoln's he's, just a he's, he's a quote he doesn't whore. say much. Lincoln will tell you he will answer anything. He won't say much. Uh, powers you do yeah. have to work you, for you it. don't know what's going to trigger it too. yes you think you asked a good question nope it falls completely flat well, and but here's the thing when it falls flat it's just like the quinn and williams questions yesterday at oh the yeah end. uh-huh it's like garen emig asked him if he'd seen quinn and williams on tape and he was an outland trophy winner what do you think he said he's a really good player and he said well is he comparable to anybody you've seen this year and he said he's a real good he's player. really good player i'm looking forward to playing him I would imagine he has wet dreams about physical contact with <laughs> a guy like Quinton Williams. I would watch what you say. I, th- I think any really good offensive lineman would. I mean, that's going to be the biggest matchup in the of the year for them. Yeah, with that defensive line. I, mean, I was told this I know last Gabe night. Has probably told you, but he thinks Quinton Williams is like the best yeah. college, the best college football player. In like the last 20 years. He also thinks that Bill is going to come up with a great game plan for him. That's what he's saying. He'd go back to the uh, Notre Dame game. Oh, on Knicks? Uh, yeah. They destroyed Knicks and that second time He makes a pretty around. good argument for it just as far as... Knicks ate his lunch the first time they yeah. played. And Gabe actually... I This is one thing I fight with Gabe all. I should just... He's probably doing his radio show, but I really yeah, should is. call him. Um, but, like, I thought Gabe had his worst game against Knicks when they played in Norman. Yeah, the first time around. Yep. And then the next year, he just kicked his ass. And guess who the addition was? Bill Beatenbow. Bill Beatenbow. Yeah. For sure. But it they embarrassed him on his own field. I mean, we, we probably don't talk about it. I mean, and we do, but it probably isn't giving enough credit how much Beatenbow, as far as game plan with the offensive line and coming up with different ideas to cut down a, you know, a defensive lineman with a fullback instead. As, as good as they are inside with Power, Samia, and Creed, you have if to have he's help. the guy that beats them, I'll be stunned. Like, don't get me wrong. Like, Alabama's going to create problems. But if he's, like, setting up shop in the backfield, I, that will blow me away because of that trio and having Bill to have a month to design, this is how we're going to deal with him. It'll be interesting to see Trey Sermon's patient approach yes if that hurts them in this game and if kennedy brooks is a better running back against this defense mm, i think i think kennedy brooks is a better running back against any defense is that fair that's fair i, I mean I, I wouldn't i wouldn't argue that opinion too much he didn't do much against texas but i think they just felt like when they got the lead they wanted to have a veteran in there hold on to the ball and and Brooks's one fumble this year was very kind of BS. He the only thing down, I would say be. for Sermon in this game is he's just a bigger, stronger guy going against a bigger, stronger defense. Like this is these guys are 10, 15 pounds heavier at positions than what OU's used to. So him being able a little more likely to take some of those blows, that kind of thing. And the thing I'll say for Kennedy Brooks is he very rarely takes a full on shot. Like, he's very good. He's, 
I've said it before, he's almost like Gumby. Like, he bends in ways that I don't think he should be able to, and he just kind of avoids the full throttle hit from most guys. But even when he gets one, he takes it well. So, I mean, I may be off. I'd just say that would be the argument I could make for Sermon, him just being a little bit more physically farther along. Have I told you guys what I think uh, Kenny Brooks' nickname should be? Mm -mm. The Natural. Not bad. He's like a he's like a left handed Will Clark of a running back that's just like you can't really you look at him and you don't you don't see a physically imposing guy, but then he swings the bat and holy shit you know he just hit it four hundred and fifty feet. It definitely, I mean, like he just does everything. He doesn't look like he's running fast. You're not wrong. I mean, it's it's incredible just the way that he busts through. A- it's hard to explain what makes him great. I've asked coaches that question, Kerry, from high school, college guys, and I've never been able to get an answer that I thought really put it into words. Like, it's, it's, and they, they'll acknowledge it. Like, it's, the sum is just more than the parts. Like, you don't really understand why he's as good as he is, but he's Roy, no matter, he's the Roy Hobbs of running backs. Yeah. When you put him on the field, all he do does is make plays. Have, I'm, I'm just trying to think of somebody. Racing. I'm trying to think of somebody that a running back, be, yeah, like would even be comparable. I mean, I, he definitely not Barry Sanders. He's not Barry Sanders, but it's, he's not. He's not even. He's as smooth as Sanders was, just from the videos I've seen. He's just not as herky jerky. In yeah, his he's style. not, and he's not ripping off. He's kind of like he's kind of like Spins and Dee Dee Westbrook in that he has hidden strength. Like he's not. He's stronger. I bet his legs. This is really we've had some weird conversations, but I bet if you look at his legs, like they're like super veiny. We'll have to see. Maybe we'll get him. Uh, maybe we'll get him without some, <laughs> some shorts on in Miami. I know. Brooks. I mean, I just see like I just see like you know pulsating thighs. Like if you see him wow. up close, like I just I think that there's some superhuman strength in there somewhere in his legs. I know we've had eject and pulsating within about a minute of each other. This making me real uncomfortable. Bob, you go. (laughs) He keeps getting interrupted. I know Brooks liked the tweet that compared him to Robert Smith. All right, I'm done. Yeah, that's a good. That's a decent comparison. (laughs) I wouldn't want to be compared to that loser. But yeah, he opens his mouth in his football career. I mean, he 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 was a quitter. Robert Smith quit. He did quit. Wasn't it kind of weird, too? Well, and th- it was a bullshit story, too. It was like, oh, Robert Smith, he wants to go to medical school. He's a different kind of football player. He's not your average. And then he went into media. <laughs> like, that, that. come on, dude. You're not that smart. And he's proven it. I wouldn't want him operating on me, that's for sure. No. Absolutely not. Okay, so uh, Lincoln Riley's been jetting all over the place. Let's get to some recruiting trail stuff. First, before we do that, I want to remind you guys uh, that uh, Eskridge Lexus uh, in Oklahoma City sending us down to the Orange Bowl. We're going to be doing a lot of reports uh, while we're there, thanks to Eskridge. And uh, it's December to remember event right now. They've got all the 2019s on the loss with uh, on the lots with deep discounts. And uh, if you go in there and uh, tell them you're a Sooner Scoop podcast listener, SoonerScoop.com subscriber, uh, you'll get even deeper discounts. So. Uh, if you're looking at a new car, you want to get something nice, uh, maybe like the uh, R the three the RX 350, the SUV. We've driven that one this year. The ES. Uh, if you're the businessman on the go and you just want a really nice sedan, go check it out. They've got uh, lots of different models for you to choose from. Uh, luxury vehicles, and they are. I can tell you, I've driven one for ten years now. They're they're it's the best car. I'll never have anything else but a Lexus. So. Eskridge Lexus, thank to them, thanks to them, EskridgeLexus.com. Give Ed Eskridge a call uh, if you're looking for your new Lexus and get a great discount. Okay, so Lincoln Riley, uh, his assistants have been out on the road. I would say, I don't know, I mean, to me it looks like if you're talking about defensive coaches, we can get into all this stuff, but Tim Kish, Kerry Cooks, and, and Calvin Thibodeau really have been spearheading the defensive recruiting along with Lincoln, wouldn't you say? Yeah, I mean, that's not too out of the – Ordinary. I mean, Lincoln as Diaco worked. is not. I guess that's right. one yeah, thing yeah, to point yeah, out. Yes, yes. Uh, I mean, or Ruffin thing, really I mean, that much. Yeah, you figure Ruffin probably can't travel that well that often. Yeah, probably got to make sure you space out those those trips. And he might be back in Norman. 
trying to think of a game plan. Well, and he's also they've got to have someone planning practices and exactly. running practices. I'm assuming I meant to ask Lincoln that yesterday, but um, I would assume that's one of his biggest responsibilities right now. Yeah, I mean the thing with Lincoln, he's fought so hard the last two years to not be an offensive head coach to be in there with all defensive kids. That this is where it pays off. This is where it's really going to pay off because you have the uncertainty, defensive coordinator, defensive staff, and I just don't think it's going to matter too much in the grand scheme of things because Lincoln Riley's been there the entire step of the way to let those kids, to let those parents know exactly what is about to go down. Uh, now let's talk about, you know, just defensively, Josh, you know, just your read on kids in general. How has it been? Uh, how have guys kind of reacted to not ha- not knowing who their defensive coordinator is going to be, possibly not knowing who their position coach is going to be? Yeah, and, you know, guys, I know the four of us have talked about it, and I've kind of been working on a story and talking to a lot of the defensive commitments. And, you know, most of them are handling it. You know, it's kind of a we trust Lincoln thing. You know, they, they trust that he's going to go out and make the changes that need to be made. Um, I, to a man, they all, you know, we loved coach Stoops. We liked him. You know, we, we were going to play for him, but we understand why the choice was made. So, I mean, it's been a lot of very politically savvy answers basically. Um, but I, it, it's, it's just interesting because you can tell, especially with the guys that are uncommitted. Like I kind of talked to Jeremiah Cordell about it the other night and just kind of, you know, tell, we just got into a kind of an offhanded conversation. I was like, man, I'd love to be a fly on the wall hearing what they're telling you about this, you know, what the defense is going to be like, how they're going to present it, you know, what are they telling you? And he was like, you know, and he just made it clear that there's not a definitive answer. It's not like OU's telling, like, they haven't developed a company line and say, well, this is it, this is it, and they just repeat it to every guy. I think it's just more of a, you know, guys, we've made the playoffs, we want to see this thing through. And then after the season, we're going to come up with some ideas and decide what what direction we need to go. But again, I think with all these kids, they just trust that Lincoln Riley because they all have real relationships with him rather than just kind of peripheral. Well, okay, he came in for an in-home visit or whatever. They know him. They trust him. They know he's revered as a really smart head coach. So they think it's going to be fine. But again, I think all these kids also acknowledge that they're going into this a little bit blind. And you heard Riley yesterday give his explanation about how if you were a senior on on his team, what would you rather him be focused on? The search defensive coordinator or getting the team ready for the college football playoff? I never heard it phrased that way. It's still kind of political type of answer, but it's it's what he's going with now. Well, I think it's kind of a I don't know about genius move, but it does make sense. I mean, how can you how who's gonna argue against that if you're a if you're a recruit that he's going to stick up for you if you're on his team or not stick up for you, but look out for back your best you. interest. Yeah. yeah. Or back you. I mean, it, it definitely, I, I well, thought that it, was handled pretty well. If you're Lincoln, not unsurprisingly, all you really have to do. And look, it's, you're going to get negative recruited against no matter what, but all he has to do is say, look, our defense has not been what we want it to be the last two years. We still made the college football playoff. So like we're going to get better. You're going to make us better. We're still going to go to the college football playoff, even with the defenses that we have right now. So we're going to go, and, and if, if we get our defense better, we're actually going to win the college football playoffs. So why not come here? It's better oh, than he going. Is? It's better than going. I mean, like you can go to Michigan, sure. You can go to Ohio State, but they're not going as often as we are right he now. He has the ultimate trump card right now as far as they continue winning. They've won four straight Big 12 championships. They have two back-to-back Heisman winners. Uh, they're in contention for just about every meaningful individual award out there outside of uh, the defense, which is obvious. But, I mean, I, I can't imagine that selling the Oklahoma product right now is too hard to anybody. Well, with the exception of Alabama and Clemson, who has more to sell? Yeah, that's exactly right. They have, they're have they in a pretty damn good situation, even without a defense coordinator right now. It was, uh, well, and, and just back to the recruiting trail, just, I don't know, Josh, let's start with you. Kind of what have been kind of the highlights for you so far, just with the coaches out on the road? Well, I don't think there's any question that them, uh, Lincoln Riley hitting Southern California uh, earlier this week was kind of one of the real pinnacle moments, just seeing what was going to play out, how that was going to go for Oklahoma. From everything I've heard, 
the Jeremiah Cradell uh, in home went really well. Oklahoma felt really good about that. Um, he didn't. I, I know there's been some that kind of believe he pulled the trigger. From everything I've learned, that has not happened. Um, I, I think he was being. Uh, he and I have talked for a long time, so we've got a pretty good relationship. And, and I think he was pretty honest with me that you know no big decisions have been made. He's going to go to Oregon this weekend, and that's obviously a huge hurdle to clear. And usually, when a school gets the last visit. That's that's pretty tough to overcome. So we'll see how things progress after the weekend. But going into it, I think Oklahoma leads, and I think it's just a matter of if they can hang on to him. Um, the other being Chris Steele, the five-star corner from St. John Bosco. Um, I think that visit went well. I think it was kind of like Marvin Wilson a few years ago. Oklahoma went in there. They gave it their best shot. They, they tried to sell. But they probably were never, no matter what was said in that in-home visit, you know, they could have told him, we're going to hire your three favorite high school coaches. And he's probably still not coming to Oklahoma. So, what if um, they dropped I, like a $25,000 bag? Yeah. I mean, okay, you know, hey, you know, I, I don't know what Chris's price is, but maybe there's a price there. Everybody's got um, their own price. Exactly. But with, with, other, with, that, with that notable exception, um, I, I think Oklahoma – I think everybody pretty much expects him to go to Florida, and there's not a lot I've heard to change that. So I think that was kind of the the, the big one um, of this week. And then I continue to hear really positive stuff about Marcus Stripling, um, LaRon Stokes, the defensive end from NEO. We can get into him a little bit if we want to. But uh, Riley went and saw him this week, and he'll take his official this weekend. Um, so I, I think Oklahoma is going to get some good news on Wednesday. I don't know how much of it just yet. Well, Josh, I was pretty surprised at how big Stokes really is. Sometimes you like seeing these guys take pictures with those coaches to get a better feel of how big or how tall, how strong they really are. Seems like a le- legit dude. And you, you mentioned him coming in this weekend. How is this weekend shaping up? Are there any last minute changes or are we still pretty good to go from what, what we've been hearing? It looks like it's going to be three guys. Uh, obviously, Tommy Kennedy. We should probably talk a little bit about him. The Butler grad transfer, as I butchered multiple times last night, um, is going to. He's on campus right now. I think Oklahoma's in really good shape there. I think he became more important after Myron Cunningham picked Arkansas earlier this week. Um, a, a guy that could be a plug and play type guy on the offensive line. At the very worst, is very good. You know, experience depth that Oklahoma would bring in. Um, but I, I guess with, um, wow, I look, this is, Weekend this is visit. awful. Weekend yes. visits. Wow. Totally lost my train of thought. Tommy Kennedy took me somewhere else. Uh, but yeah, weekend visits. I think you're looking at, um, Ramondre Stevenson is still a, a good possibility. I, I think it's kind of a, it's been set. We'll see if he actually does it. And I think it's not so much a matter of if he will or won't eventually take a trip. It's just whether it will be this weekend. Um, Laron Stokes, who already mentioned the defensive lineman from NEO, and as Bob said, really big, impressive-looking guy. From what I've heard, there's a lot they like about his versatility. I think they feel like he can line up in a lot of different ways and be uh, a pretty natural fit for what OU's done defensively over the last few years. Now, what that means going forward, it's hard to say. Uh, the final one is probably the most interesting one, and that's Tyrion Davis, the uh, running back from Baton Rouge that's committed to LSU. Now, I say most interesting, I think it's going to be really hard for anything to come out of this trip, but like Stevenson, if he makes that trip up, he's been up there numerous times. Uh, it, it, Norman, Oklahoma in December is not exactly a hot vacation spot, so it's not like he's going to do it just to kind of go goof around. So, Oklahoma, you know, maybe they could shock the world, but it would be pretty surprising. But uh, the thing I will say is he's never, ever shut the door in Oklahoma. He has stayed in frequent contact with Jay Bolwer. There's always been good conversation. I mean, he's talked to me. He's talked to other reporters. So there's always been some affinity for Oklahoma. And if Oklahoma can get him up, then, you know, maybe maybe he could be the big surprise of this first signing day. Do you... Do you like when they bring two of the same position when there's only one spot to fill? I think it's situational. Um, In this one, I don't mind it so much because I think they know Tyrion Davis is a long shot. I think they know that, you know, especially with the new offer from USC going to Ramondre Stevenson yesterday, that maybe they get him on campus and say, you know, because he doesn't know what Davis's situation is. He has no idea. 
So they can kind of be like, you know, we really like this high school kid, but we need an instant guy. So if you want this spot, it's the only one we have and you can take it now. And then they can even push him into, okay, why don't you go ahead and sign Hurley? So there, it creates some availability, some pressure. I think sometimes it's a risk, but I don't think in this situation you're really having to juggle too much because the idea that Davis is going to flip over the weekend is pretty unlikely. But you can get a guess where he is and then say, okay, we're going to push for Stevenson. So it, it allows you to kind of see where things are. But, yeah, it's a great question because I don't think it works every weekend. And then, Josh, I guess the last one from me, let's talk about Jordan Battle with Dax, Dax Hill and all, all that stuff going on. Does it help OU at all here in the next 48 hours or, or so to try to flip Battle? Well, and, Bob, you read the same stuff I did. There was a lot of initial reporting and kind of gossip that, well, okay, that means Jordan Battle's out at Alabama. I talked to Alabama people. That was not true. Now, there is a first-come, first-serve, and with the reality that Battle – I heard that, and within like 12 hours, Battle jumped up his commitment date. I, I think that's pretty telling. I think that may tell you what he's thinking. Um, my problem with Battle is, even if you want to say, okay, he's not going to go to Alabama, what has given anyone any impression that he's going to choose Oklahoma over Ohio State, where he's been committed for months and months and months? I, I understand that he's got the friendship with Jaden Davis, and there, there's a connection there, and that, that does help Oklahoma. But is it enough to overcome all that Ohio State has to sell in the defensive secondary? I mean, you come here, odds are you're going to be a draft pick. Like, I, it just, I, I don't know that I can believe that, especially when OU has such a, they're almost hamstrung in the way they can recruit him because they can't tell him who their defensive coordinator is going to be. They can't tell him how he's going to be used. They can't, you know, th- there's so much that's unknown that really the only thing they can sell him on is, at safety, you might start next year. That's how that's how dire it is for us. And Jordan Battle's a great player, so that that you know, it's not like they're selling something that they shouldn't. That's he is a guy that could come in and make that kind of impact. But I I think even if Alabama's out, which I don't believe they are, and I think that's what he'll choose tomorrow. If they're if they're still if they're out, I still think he ends up at Ohio State. What if they offer the defense coordinator position to Jordan Battle? Well, now I don't know. What are the NCAA rules on that, Eddie? Have you been looking that up and uh, doing research? I guess he would have to become a player, or yeah, a player. Coach. I think that's against even state rules. I think you have to have a college degree. To oh yeah. Okay, true. I think say so. can you? Uh, you know, it'd be a way around paying the players. I mean, it's really kind of genius. It's kind of like making a player a GA. You, you got to go do the undergrad before you can do the yeah, graduate. That's true. Yeah. Well, right. Eddie's taking Calcutta to Cleveland. Well, that's professional. That's so, professional ball. So he was just asking if you could do it in college. So does Eddie, in this plan, does Grant just sit out the year until he's re- eligible for the NFL draft? Well, he'd have to retire. Okay, so he just he's hanging up his spurs after two years. I got you it. you want to okay. play college football and possibly risk CTE, or do you want to go live on the banks of the Erie with me, uh, Baker, and his wife? And chase some Ohio Strange? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, okay. Uh, Maybe contract syphilis. <laughs> Jesus, <laughs> you know, I was you I was didn't talk fast enough. Kevin. Better than the AIDS. <laughs> I was wi- God damn it! <laughs> Still not waiting <laughs> for the recruiting talk to end. Ouch, Josh, that kind of hurts. <laughs> no, because to transition into something else, and between then, I would talk about Coop Ale Works. But Eddie wanted to talk about AIDS instead. Well, I guarantee everybody's listening right now. We have their undivided attention. I can tell you that you will not get AIDS. Okay, I'm not done. Uh, <laughs> that's, a, a that's a horrible read. <laughs> Look, uh, you will have conversations like this with your friends when you're drinking a lot of uh, beer, and you'll be happier if that beer is Coop Ale Works. Go to coopaleworks.com. Check out their full selection. Right now, they've got their winter seasonal going, the Grand Sport Porter. Uh, and They've got four different seasons uh, where they do beers, like in the summer, it's the Flyway IPA, uh, but right now it's the Grand Sport Porter, uh, and that goes along with all their great regular beers. Uh, Eddie's favorite, the F5 IPA, uh, my favorite, the Horny Toe Blind. I'm also a big native, I'm partial to native amber as well. Uh, if you're in Dallas, also go to coupelworks.com because Dallas or surrounding areas from Oklahoma, you can find out where uh, you can get uh, Coop beer products, what even what bars serve them. Uh, and where you can go to pick them up at uh, liquor stores. 
Uh, so, yeah, uh, Coop Ale Works, a great sponsor of the podcast. Uh, been a great sponsor of the post-game podcast all year. And uh, really appreciate them being on board. We'll definitely be talking more about them while we're down in Miami as well. Okay, so we've kind of we've kind of hit the gamut here. Uh, but Lincoln Riley did talk to the media for about 20 minutes yesterday. I'm curious, uh, Bob and Eddie, kind of what were your big takeaways there? Honestly, I thought the biggest takeaway was the Marquise Brown news that he didn't have uh, a procedure. And I don't know if that really tips any hands or shows any direction on what they feel like uh, is going to gonna happen with him or if he's even going to be available come the 29th. But, um, you know, I it was kind of the way that we understood it, though. If, if you had a procedure, he's probably going to be shelved for the year, right? Well, yeah, I mean, it, I thought there was – this is just – And that's going against girls, Tua, Us who, girls talking. Um, I think there were two things that could have happened. I think it was either a sprained ligament in his foot or like a Liz Frank injury, Yeah. Uh, which if you have a Liz Frank, then you're going to have to have surgery because you're going to be out for a very long time. Yeah, that's one of those things. I mean, anybody that's a Thunder fan out there is yeah. well-versed in the Liz <laughs> yeah. Frank injury. So it just I mean, that's good news because I, I don't think that they can win this game even without Marquise Brown on the field. Lincoln really gave no indication, though, yesterday. Of not, either way, on a lot of guys. Yeah, yeah. and you had to figure he's been on the road. They're not doing anything. They're not asking them to do anything. I think they it's know. First they know pre- who's going to be. Oh yeah, but they know available. what the injury is. Yeah, and, I mean yeah. that's the thing that's kind well, of insulting. That, yeah, but, that's you know. never. He's never going to say it. I, it's just so. It's just. It's insulting until it's like, you, you know get the injury what's, report. What's going on with uh, what's what's wrong with Marquise Brown? Well, we're <laughs> hoping to find out. Like having to dude, look at it's two weeks after break down you know. pictures of him at a Kodak Black concert yeah. in yep. Oklahoma City. Oh, he doesn't have a boot. <laughs> no, but asking for my biggest takeaway is that Alabama farm system quote that that he threw out there because he might be getting ready to do to do just that in terms of getting ready get all that turnover in terms of his uh, coaches and just keep that train moving. It's amazing because until you know you become a head coach. Those things like replacing, you know, people that leave. I mean, that was that was really a you know what led to the dark times for Bob Stoops is losing. He just kept losing too many assistants, and eventually he brought in some. You know, he lost Kevin Wilson, and he had to make James Patton his offensive line coach. He brought in Bruce Kittle, uh, Bobby Jack Wright got a little long in the tooth. Uh, we all know that um, Jackie Ship. Jackie Ship stopped. You know, recruiting as hard as he once did, uh, and and there was no. It's like they talk about players need to have competition. Well, you know, Nick Saban's actually made it where coaches have competition. Like if you're not doing your job, I got somebody right behind you here that wants this job really bad. Even if it's DJ Durkin, Jesus, it's the most. Like I'm serious. Like, do you think Tom Herman has volunteered to go coach up there during you know during this next month? Well, he probably well, wouldn't if they if have Nick we... wanted him. Like. Get your crazy ass out of here, though. Have Andrew we wife. checked on Jerry Sandusky's parole situation? Well, Zach Smith might be coaching wide receivers before the end of the week. Could be. At Alabama. And, it, yeah. and I would have to apologize to you because that would have to do with our personal beef. And sorry, Lincoln. Yeah. That's bad. Just be Zach getting his revenge. I get it. Just to get it against you. Yeah. No, it's, okay. it's totally what it would be about. I mean, Zach's. Zach clearly holds a grudge really well. I mean, you can say a lot of things about Saban. He's not harboring wife beaters. Yeah, he's just harboring guys that maybe Kill players loosely connected to the murder of somebody. <laughs> <laughs> I they they should hire Brian Kelly. They should see if I he will. Say, I was waiting. Oh, you should hire Brian Kelly? No, Alabama. He fits the mold. They have two guys that have killed people. <laughs> oh, I staff. see what you're saying. Either alcohol he's not or technically player on kills. It. It's ridiculous. Yeah, it's a little. It's not, I don't know that. I mean, but, but you know what? Saban is building a reputation as the rehab specialist. He's like the. Yeah. He's he's not only a coach. He's not only a, he doesn't only put you in the NFL, but now he's getting this reputation because of Lane Kiffin. Like, I'll put you back to work. I'll restore. I'll I'll, I'll rehabilitate your coaching career. I don't I mean, know. Mike Stoops, that was one of the first things he said is maybe I'll go coach at Alabama. There's some outrage about DJ Durkin working down there, but I don't I mean, I don't really know how much he can he can help do him. at this point yeah. or anything. It's a, is the I youth worth the I squeeze? I think that kind of that shit's kind of overrated to me, but 
I don't know. That's I mean, my deal. He's not worth the headache he causes. No, not like at what's, all. What's he bring into the table other than bad publicity? Yeah. No. Basically, Saban can do. He lives in that world where he knows he can do whatever he wants. He doesn't care either. Yeah. So. Anyway, but yeah, yeah, but no, you're right, Bob. I think I think now that Lincoln's a head coach, he's kind of thinking in those terms, like, okay, well, we have to start. This this is an advantage that that they have over the rest of college football. Maybe we kind of have to. Like Clemson's not really playing that game. They're just paying a shit ton of money to their, to their coordinator, coordinator so they won't exactly. leave. So they kind of changed the game yeah. by themselves doing it that, that way because now that's become, do they make as much as Venables and, you know, and things of that nature? Do you meet that mark? Well, and that's it. The, 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 I would say this goes with it, uh, is that I think what I learned yesterday is that Lincoln ain't hired no defensive coordinator until a bowl game's over. Uh, and it, it also makes you wonder, like Pete Golding, What's he getting? Eight hundred thousand or something? Six hundred fifty. Six fifty is what he makes for Bama. Like he's a guy a lot of people would ha- love to have, but he knows if he stays at Bama, he's going to get a head coaching job if he rides that thing out, and that's the ultimate goal. Like if you're at Alabama in that system, and maybe that's maybe Lincoln speaking to that a little bit too when he says that is that like, maybe he just tipped his hand a little bit that he's not going to be able to get Pete Golding because that system that's in place keeps coaches from leaving. With the way things are going, do you think? It would be more likely that Pete Golding would be like, say, he stayed at Alabama, would be the more likely to be the next head coach at Alabama, or if he came to Oklahoma and became the next head coach at Oklahoma. You mean from if he if yeah, he like if, if Riley would stay NFL or just, Saban yeah, retired, or, but which one do you think is more likely to happen and play out quicker? Oh, I think if Saban retires, Alabama goes full bore after Kirby Smart. If Georgia continues down the road, they're going. Yeah. Yeah. We'll see what happens to Pruitt at Tennessee. But Kirby's a UGA guy. Speaking about hiring scumbags, he interviewed both Jeff Levy and and Kendall Bryles. Maybe he's just getting tips on how the hell is Kendall Bryles staying so clean? Well, and he went went from. Wasn't he somewhere before Houston? Yeah, he was with uh, Fort Fort Atlantic Atlantic for for a year. Yeah. Yeah, he was with Kiffin. That's right. He, uh, well, I mean, because he's not art. But, you know, I mean, it was a bad look because he and Jeff Lebby were both the most vocal about how screwed he was getting. Their dad or their daddy, yeah, their father-in-law. Family. I mean, I don't, what do you expect him to say, really? Well, I expect, I expect art to say, look, you guys pipe down about all this stuff. You you still have a future. I may Mark not. Miles doesn't think he did anything wrong. Yeah. I just, I, if we're going to make the case that Art Bryles knew any of these things, okay, that's a fireable offense. If there's anybody on that staff who would share in that knowledge, who are we betting on? Yeah, the family. Both man. of those guys. His son, right hand man, and offensive coordinator? And son in law. Pretty obvious. He's married to his daughter. Jeff Levy. Oh, I forget. Yeah, you said that. And I, I, wasn't, I wouldn't even think. I totally did not put that back together. No, nah, yeah, that's an ugly subject. I don't even want to. But no, I mean, as it relates to Pete Golding, and, and you know, we hear more and more about Alex Grinch and, you know, he and Shiano's relationship being really strong. And you wonder. It, it, I, just, I said this on the board the other day. Like, someone said, if you had to bet $100, yes. who would you bet on? Correct. And I would say, I'd bet on the field because it's rare when names come out like that so publicly that they end up being the guys. Well, and stay there for so long. Yeah, right, that's the point. That, that's uh huh. That that's my deal. Like usually they burn out um, because that's why people don't want you involved in their coaching search. It complete like it completely kind of uh, it, it got both fan bases kind of emboldened around those coaches. Like, oh, we can't let these guys go. Which I don't know when that changed. Like, if you're a co coordinator, and like we got to let him go. He's a co-coordinator. He's getting a coordinator job. I mean, that's what happened with Benables. Yeah. Been really weird. I don't know if anybody thought it would work out this way, though, that Oklahoma and Alabama were going to play. I mean, I guess the, yeah. you kind of 
had it, an idea it, that yeah, it might have. It was always out there. I mean, th- things had to fall a certain way, but it wasn't that crazy to say it. I, I mean, I was. I would tell you this, and I think Josh would echo this as well. I think things were heading that direction until this matchup happened. Right. The Pete Golding direction. I think that's fair. If they lose uh, I, in Morgantown, he's hired. Probably by now. Yep. Which just drives me up a wall that I I don't know. It's Although I still I maintain that I think Grinch is a better hire. I know he's not as sexy to OU fans because Golding has been, but he's got power. Know, he's, he's got power five experience. He's as got a coordinator. pace of pace of play. Yeah, experience. Yep. He's got a lot more experience dealing with what what you will have to deal with as OU's DC than Golding does, which is absolutely none. Yeah, no, I think you're right. I think they're both psychotic for wanting to be defense coordinators in this league. I don't hey. know that they do, <laughs> or they might have well, been hired by now. What's so funny is you hear all these, you know, you hear the SEC guys talk, oh, well, the Big 12, they're just, they don't, you know, they don't play any defense over there. But when a SEC coordinator or well-thought-of guy either comes to the Big 12 or has the opportunity to, they either get their head kicked in or, secondly, they don't want to do it. Because they know what, it, they know it's not just about, oh, the defense is just really bad. If they had the right guy over there, it'd fix everything. No, it's not. These offenses are stressful in ways the SEC knows nothing about. The The reward for doing well in the Big 12 isn't as big as the risk it would be to ruin your reputation, basically. And, I mean, that's basically what happened to Mike Stoops. I mean, to be honest, his reputation was ruined over the course of six years. And he had a, he had a part in it. I mean, it's his fault, but I don't know if it's entirely his fault. But What's amazing is, is like, watching – that they've been playing that Alabama Sugar Bowl, like crazy, like crazy on Fox, Fox Sports, and you realize like uh, Mike Stoops was the defensive coordinator in that game. Like they created a bunch of turnovers, Four. a lot of pressure. Like they were they were all over AJ McCarron that night. So had some guys that played in the NFL. Yeah. Well, I mean, if Geno Grissom's good enough for Bill Belichick, he's good enough. Eric for Stryker was the best player on that field, though. Yeah. Cyrus Quanjo just got obliterated that night. Yeah, he had a rough night. There's no doubt about that. You clearly weren't watching Deontay Savage. <laughs> <laughs> he had a great night as well. That that I, we won't go into that offensive line playing that game that night is still one of the craziest. Oh, like, people talk about Trevor Knight. Unbelievable. The O line is what amazes me. Bronson Irwin was your starting right tackle. And did a really good job. He did. His only game ever. At tackle. And I remember I made some comment like during the game, and it was like, whoever would have thought Bronson Irwin could play right tackle like this or something like that? And Bronson literally quote teaches me after the game. He's like, thanks a lot. Sorry. <laughs> like, my bad. Like, I just, I mean, come on. If, if he could have played like that, he should have been starting there all year. Well, that was why nobody gave him a chance is because the offensive line was such a wreck. What was, what was it happened? Because they had to start freaking Farniok against Oklahoma State and they knew that would never work against Alabama. Farniok has got to be Farniok has got well it was uh Daryl it was Daryl Williams, Tyrus Thompson, Tyrus right? Thompson. They were their edge guys. I think Tyrus Thompson got hurt. Yeah. Like cuz Williams played in that game. Um but yeah, they didn't have a they had Farniok was all they had as a backup. Mhm. Farniok's got to be the one guy that Bill Bedenboe has coached that he couldn't help. Like, there was no helping Derek Farniak. Like, he's he just he gave him a chance. He tried to start him. And he was, no, I'm sorry. You just you can't play here. I, I don't think he ever played another down after that Texas game that they and lost. And then your brothers can't come here. <laughs> yeah, he basically got his brothers. His, his youngest brother is actually pretty good. His, his oldest brother that played at Iowa State's the best one that was the center. Mm-hmm. But yeah, basically, no. I'm sorry. You, you, you no more Farniok. Sorry, Farniok family. We'll never be allowed back into North Dakota or South Dakota, wherever the f- they're from. I think South Dakota, one Sioux the, Falls, one of the that... Dakotas. Uh, okay. I don't even know if those are real states, to be honest. <laughs> they are. I had baseball roommates from South Dakota, or maybe Bismarck, Is that That's North a, Dakota, Idaho, isn't it? No, it is North Dakota. Uh, so, 
No, but outside of that with Lincoln, you know, yeah, the, the Saban stuff was interesting. Uh, he did mention that Jalen Redmond will not be back for the bowl game, which wasn't hard to... to uh, and, and I asked him about Chance Sylvie. And I think it's just kind of a, we'll see what happens with him. Yeah, I mean, we didn't get updates on Jordan Parker, Justin Broyles. He wasn't given just not the time, I guess, for him to say something. Ho- hopefully he'll actually well, give something more com- concrete i hate doing it just because it's such it's, it's such a mood killer because you got national media there and you're asking about how's well, justin Broyles' injury status and you just feel kind of like a he you idiot why and, they're in our show they should be thankful that they're even allowed in the, well i know there's there's nothing wrong with george no dennis dodd's an idiot though i okay I'm that's my opinion. fine, and I'm fine with you saying that. It's my opinion. I don't know if I'd go that far, but he's got a very cush job. Okay, I then out of touch with like, reality. Like, like I don't know how many jobs like his exist, and he might have the only job of its kind. Who's he even work for? CBS. CBS. See, there you go. You have no idea. I, I mean, it's like if because everything that he writes is dumb. It's like if uh, AOL had a national writer still that traveled wherever he wanted, got paid a whole lot of money, and just wrote columns. Like, who's really reading that shit? Nobody. I'm answering your question. <laughs> <laughs> well, it goes, we talk about that for conference writers, at papers, that, that's That's gone, gone. yeah. Yeah. So, um, but yeah, I mean, the, the injury stuff was out there. I mean, the Kyler Murray, you know, we talked about that at the beginning of the show a little bit. Um I can't even remember what was in the first episode that we we didn't record. Oh, it was about Kyla, about Kyla knows how it's just. Oh yeah, stop asking them that question. I know you feel like you have to, and you're breaking new new ground if you're going to play football or or baseball. Just let it play out. He'll figure things out, especially with the draft. But guess what? Eval. At the Orange Bowl on Media Day, at least it's getting, only forty five minutes. He, he is going to get that question no less than eight times. He should just have a pre-recorded answer, and then every time it's asked, he just plays it. Well, didn't Gabe, then everybody writes what a giant penis he is? Didn't Gabe sort of do matter? that? Remember Big Twelve Media Days with uh, Trevor uh, Blake and Blake Bell, and Gabe kind of gave a re- yeah, probably. Yeah. That seems to ring a bell. But no, I mean, I you know, just it is amazing what Kyler did, and. I would like. I'll say that I would like to see him try the NFL. I'd like to see what happens. I think he should stay with baseball because I think he can make more money long term. I'd like to see him try the NFL. Just because I, it, it would really, he'd be the first five nine guy to really break that stereotype. Because people tried to make Baker into a five nine guy. And he wasn't. Yeah, he's closer to six one than yeah. five, five ten. So, um, outside of that, I mean, the Sooners are back to practice. Uh, a lot of young guys are working out right now. Uh, we'll find out more on Marquise Brown. The team actually gets there on the twenty third. I'm starting to wonder if we're going to get to talk to any players. Like it's been hard to do yeah. background on some of the stories that I would like to write for this game, and I don't know if there's from what we were told there probably won't be any media next week besides signing day with besides Lincoln signing and day, Kale. Which seems weird. Yeah, um, I bet they blow that off too. By the way, isn't it weird that it, this is? I just realized this because you mentioned Kale. Like there has been absolutely no attention placed on Kale as the recruiting coordinator anymore. Lincoln does all. I mean, Lincoln's I mean, so and not to say that, and I'm not ever present saying that in he recruiting, doesn't, but and then, but he really like Lincoln really is. I mean, no one looks at Kale as the lead, you know the, right. the recruiting guy, and anymore. then Annie Hanson and yeah. Drew Hill and Chip Chip Viney they yeah. do the real legwork behind the scenes, and Lincoln, I, I don't know how big a role Kale really has. Yeah, at this point. I mean, he still does a great job with what he has to do. Yeah, but his job load. But the people feel who like, are planning all yeah. the you know tweets and social and all that stuff like that's not Kale. Exactly. Maybe he has to approve that stuff. I don't know. I doubt anybody would even tell us what the hierarchy is. 
Um, but yeah, I mean, just because Lincoln is so forward facing with recruiting, and that's smart that they do that. You make him the face of your program. You make him the face of recruiting. Everyone's, and even as the media, we all just look at it like Lincoln's the guy to go to to ask about recruiting stuff. It looks like he enjoys it too. Yeah. You know, he gets real enthusiasm when he starts talking about that stuff. All right. Um, Josh, any, uh, anything to add before we get out of here? No, I don't think I've got anything. Um, <laughs> All right. What happened? It's just <laughs> the tone. The, <laughs> I don't think. Uh, well, I, like I always, I'm never ever, you guys know me, like when we do this, I'm like a blank slate. So I was not in prepared for the next question. So um, OU should be done with most of their in homes. Like I said, we'll track Tommy Kennedy, the, uh, the Butler grad transfer. He should leave tomorrow since he arrived last night so oklahoma also have him through today and through most of tomorrow uh, and then he's supposed to go to miami but with what's going on at miami with the manny diaz how that class is kind of falling apart i don't i don't know what impact that's going to play yet so mm-hmm. i still think oklahoma's in a good spot for him and he's probably the most likely guy to maybe to pop here in the next 48 hours or so well when does the dead period start it's monday to signing day so on yep. sun on sunday contact at- period like you can only you can't do in homes. I don't. Yeah, believe there'll be Sunday. no more in homes. Yeah, you, basically. You, yes. Right. Pretty much, you know, like because a lot of the guys that you're going to be doing that stuff with are going to be on business this weekend. So pretty much tonight will be the last real in homes. And right. to my knowledge, I don't know of Oklahoma being. I, I certainly don't know of Lincoln Riley being right. anywhere. I would think and, assistants maybe for sure, but couple, I've yeah, heard a couple of here and there with Lincoln Riley for because I and I know it's just the class is so full that yeah I mean like. Don't get me wrong. Um, Dennis Simmons and Kale Gundy may go see Trajan Bridges tonight, but like most of the in homes at this point are going to be, you know, guys already in the books and that's basically just waiting to sign. By the way, is the is the tea cafe the weirdest offensive lineman food hangout? I eat the same thing as Ben Pollard. I, I don't know the if that's. I don't know if that's good or bad. Well, everything you eat has the potential to kill you. We've learned. Similar frame, Bob. Yes. It might be. It might be a little weird. It's good. It's, it's I wouldn't say it's the best place on campus corner. No. I mean for, it's good. For thai food, it's fine. I wouldn't even say it's the best. I'd say Pad Thai is. The actual restaurant. You right? like the pad place thai. that Yeah, that, that restaurant's good. They've got some health issues. I know. That's why we had, matter to me. That's, we gotta stop going. I know Eddie's like well like, with a you know It makes it better. <laughs> it makes it better that way. <laughs> I know Eddie is Eddie got very triggered when people started reporting them for how they were handling their meat. Or chicken. I worry a lot about how people handle their meat. <laughs> Go ahead and run with that one. Just do it well. Um But yeah, I I that just like you tell me like Italian or you know, like it used to be Johnny's offensive lineman would go there on Tuesdays, which Josh is a huge fan of. Yes. Burger night. Yeah, but that makes sense. It's all you can eat burgers or whatever whatever the half price burgers. Half I price burgers. Yeah. So they would go to town. But yeah, just eating a bowl of pad thai. It does sound pretty good. I mean it sounds good, but that's not an offensive lineman meal. I guess times are changing though. Millennials. Kids. I think there'd be a lot of people that say they don't care what what they eat as long as they keep playing the way they're doing. Yes. There's no doubt that that will happen. All right. Uh, that'll do it for this episode. Uh, we'll be back again next week, I think. You think Are we'll we? be post-signing day Wednesday or Thursday? Oh, that's Maybe a good question. still be we, determined. Yeah, we'll probably be back again on Thursday next week, so you might prepare for that. Uh, that'll give us time to break down the signing day stuff. So, um, But that'll do it for this show. Thanks to Josh. Thanks to Eddie. Thanks to Bob. I'm Kerry Murdoch, and we'll see you right here uh, back again next week on the Choctaw Casino and Resort in Durant, unofficial 40 podcast.